Um, what I'm going to do and what you're about to hear is, is quite different from what uh, you have heard um, so far this afternoon. It has certainly links to the first talk we heard this morning from the Minister. But I want to preface it before I begin um, just by adding a little bit more detail to uh, my own biography and how I came to be speaking about this. Um, I went out to Africa at the age of two with my parents in the, in the mid-1960s. So, am I using this one? No, or this you one? can use the one you're on, you just can't walk too far that Okay. <laughs> um, and I grew up in Africa. Uh, I did all of my schooling there, uh, and then went back to university in, in England. Um, and then I came back to Africa after university to work as a vegetation ecologist. So much of what I uh, have heard this afternoon uh, is familiar to me in, in the work that I still do in vegetation can ecology. Can you make sure your, your lapel mic is actually on? It does. It is on. Okay, carry on. Anyway, people can hear me, I think, so I'll stay here. Um, and in the course of my, my work, I, I have um, mapped vegetation in Africa and then also in Madagascar. And I want to first give you a perspective from Madagascar. Uh, Madagascar uh, is one of the poorest countries in the world. It is also a hotspot for, for plant diversity. So we think there are between 12,000 and 14,000 plant species in Madagascar. 90% of them occur no one else, nowhere else. Um, and Missouri Botanical Garden have recently finished uh, mapping against herbarium records where these species occur. Uh, and they have found that there are over 1,000 endemic species in Madagascar that are known from a single locality. Um, and worse than that, the vegetation survey that we did suggests that there is only 18% of primary vegetation left and that a third of that primary vegetation has been lost in the last 40 years. So it's highly likely that most of those 1,000 endemic species uh, are no longer there. And certainly when you map them, they're on the plateau, which has been completely trashed uh, by people. People have only been on Madagascar for 1,500 years. But largely clearing for, for agriculture uh, and slash and burn for, um, for cattle has caused that devastation. So in Madagascar, there is no question uh, of in situ conservation for many of these plant species. Uh, we are down to ex situ conservation as the, as the only option um, for many of those species. It's a very poor country. The, the, the protected area network doesn't work where, uh, where areas are supposed to be protected. So we are into triage and we are into doing what we can. I then want to give you a, a, another perspective, and that's um, going back to England, uh, where I have been um, for the last too long. I find it a very cold and wet place. <laughs> but Britain is, uh, of course, a completely transformed landscape. Um, there is no part of Britain which is not man-managed. The national parks there have people and sheep living in them. Um, and, of course, the native flora is a new flora. It has come in largely since the last ice age in the last 10,000 years. Uh, and it is impoverished. There are maybe 1,500 species uh, of native plant in Britain, which is one of the reasons why Britain exports botanists. We have more botanists than plant species in Britain. <laughs> but Britain is a far more diverse place than it was a thousand years ago. And when you look at the number of plants which are cultivated, admittedly uh, in a maritime climate, the, the, the Royal Horticultural Society tells us that we cultivate at least 70,000 different taxa uh, in our gardens. And so that is a, an entirely different perspective about the way that we manage plant diversity in diverse landscapes. Uh, and it is the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment's techno-gardening scenario. We are already there uh, in Western Europe. Uh, and every techno-garden uh, is legitimate, whether it be for conservation purposes, um, and there is a huge conservation lobby and a lot of interest, a lot of it sitting with civil society as here, uh, or whether it's Mrs. Jones's back garden, which is providing a beautiful flower display in June. You know, all of those are legitimate uses uh, of managing species assemblages uh, of plants. Um, so I'm going to make two assumptions before I start with this. The first is that to, to use a slightly different older Leopold quote, um, who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts? To keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. A quote that I first saw in Garden of the Woods 10, 10 years ago, and I've used all around the world. 
So I'm going to make the assumption that keeping every cog and wheel for whatever purpose, conservation to food, uh, is a good idea. I'm going to make a second uh, assumption, and that is that how we manage plant diversity in the landscape means all landscapes. It means from back gardens to national parks. Uh, and again, you know, we need the plants to be able to do that. What I'm interested in as a scientist is how we do that. How do we keep every cog and wheel? Uh, and how do we manage that plant diversity in the landscape for whatever purpose? And that's why I'm interested in looking at how some of the other sectors do it. And it's been interesting to hear from foresters today. Um, we've not heard from any crop scientists, but I want to look at, uh, at what the crop community does and what the forestry community does in managing increasingly complex species assemblages for resilience and see if there's anything that we can learn, particularly as botanic gardens, uh, about what we can do to conserve the whole range of plant diversity and use it to manage it in landscapes. So I'm going to talk about the context, which we all know about. That's diminishing plant diversity. Um, I'm get, then going to have a look at the, the very latest report on the state of the world's plants, forest genetic resources, the first report of its kind that came out last year, which a lot of people don't, don't know about, but is, um, is a fantastic um, document, I think, and a lot of work went into it. Uh, I'm going to then look at um, state of the world's plants, plant genetic resources in food and agriculture, and the crop community is way uh, ahead of us uh, that work in, in wild plant diversity in, in many ways. Um, and one of the things that they have developed is, or starting to develop, um, is a rational cost-effective global system for the conservation and use of plants in food and agriculture. I then want to have a look at how we might um, adopt or use some of those uh, approaches that, that they have used for, for wild plant diversity or for, for right across the taxonomic array. Then look at the role of botanic gardens, how would we go about building a global system that was rather more effective than the system that we have at the moment? And then I promise you I will get to some pictures of plants um, so that we can talk about a few of those as case studies. So this is the context. You all know about this. Um, roughly 20% of plant species currently threatened with extinction. That estimate comes from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment of 2005. And of course the major drivers there are land use change and overexploitation. It stands to reason that if we have transformed 40% of the terrestrial landscape to cultivate plants, then the wild plants that used to live in those places are going to be under threat. Why does this matter? Well, because plant-based solutions will be required to address all of the major environmental challenges. They are already um, addressing those challenges. Um, food security, we need new crops, and we're constantly developing new crop varieties to keep up with increasing population and to, to keep up with the threats and, and so on to our food security. Water scarcity, we are learning gradually to put back more complex species assemblages for catchment forests. Uh, and we're learning to put in trees that use less water. Energy, think of biomass, biofuels. Uh, in developing countries, most of the energy comes from wood and from charcoal. Human health, still three quarters of the world's population rely on traditional medicines for their primary health care. Um, and that's mainly plants. 5,000 different species used in traditional Chinese medicine, 7,000 on the Indian subcontinent, and so on. And then biodiversity conservation itself. You know, if you want to conserve your charismatic tiger or your panda, you need to be conserving the habitats uh, and the plants uh, at the base of the trophic pyramid. And then both adaptation and mitigation of climate change, and I'll give you some examples of that. In short, plant diversity taken as a whole that enables human innovation, adaptation, and resilience. Um, and that is a positive statement. Uh, I'm not saying that if we don't lose a few plant species that we're all going to die. What I'm saying is that for every species that we keep, we keep uh, options open. Uh, and they won't all be useful. Um, there's no doubt about that. But they may all be useful to somebody. Uh, and if it's conservation that drives you, and uh, you know, it was good to hear from Bill yesterday that ideologically you think it is the right thing to conserve diversity. There are a lot of people who feel the same, and that is equally legitimate, it seems to me. So let's have a quick look at, at a subset um, of that plant diversity. Let's look at forest genetic resources. Um, and as I said, the first Food and Agriculture um, Organization of the, of the UN State of the World's Forest Genetic Resources Report came out last year. There's the hyperlink in there to it if anybody is interested. 
Um, and it complements um, the FAO State of the World's Forest Reports, which have been produced um, for uh, rather a long time now, for the last 10 years, that tell us um, how, what, what forestry extent is uh, in the world uh, and how quickly it's diminishing. But this Forest Genetic Resources Report is looking specifically at, at forest species diversity. Um, and it's based on information provided by 86 countries. It includes an overview of definitions and concepts related to forest genetic resources and their values. So for, for one thing, what is a tree? I mean, that, that, that is a, a question that different people answer in different ways. It gives descriptions of the main drivers of change, um, key emerging technologies, uh, an analysis of the current status of conservation uh, and use, and recommendations. Now, it also includes five thematic studies, and I contributed to the last one there, um, sorry, to the second to the last one, genetic considerations in ecosystem restoration using native tree species. And I've been rather disappointed at, at how few people seem to know it even exists. But they, they are very good documents, and I can recommend them to you if you're interested um, in uh, any of these issues. And I think probably most people in this, this room would be interested in, uh, in those issues because they do transcend um, plant conservation. Now, here's some figures. The first one is, is an interesting figure in itself, this 80,000 to 100,000 tree, uh, tree species as the estimated total. As I say, to a certain extent, it depends on how you define a tree. But there is no global list uh, of tree species. We do not know how many tree species there are in the world. And this figure comes from um, an IUCN uh, red listing report of 1997 carried out actually by my predecessor, Sarah Oldfield, at Botanic Gardens Conservation International. And this was the rough figure. It's about 25% of total plant diversity. We are at BGCI now in the process of trying to put together the world's first um, comprehensive list uh, of tree species. And we're at 60,000, uh, and we're still going. Very few countries have detailed tree species checklists, um, and information on conservation status is, is often not available. Now it gets interesting. So only 8,000 or 10% of tree, shrub, palm, and bamboo species are mentioned as being used in country reports. That is less than 10% of the total. Now the other way to look at that is to say that we have 90% out there that gives us room for innovation and adaptation that are not currently used uh, in commercial forestry in any way. Of those 8,000, only 2,400 are actively managed. In other words, a large proportion of those 8,000 are collected from the wild, they're harvested from the wild, and so on. And then this one at the bottom, genetic level information is available only for 500 to 600 species worldwide. Um, that is quite scary. That is less than, than 1%. And what it means is that we don't know very much about trees. We certainly don't know very much about how to grow trees. Some other key findings here. Economic value is the main factor in setting management priorities, not surprising there. Uh, main products and functions are timber, uh, non-wood forest products, and energy. Now, this, this does vary enormously depending on where you are. And um, you know, a few years ago, the current government in the UK tried to sell off uh, the public forest estate. Um, it's a conservative government. They didn't want the burden of, of managing 250,000 hectares of, of public forest. So they tried to sell it off. There was uproar. Um, and those who were opposed to it um, brought some economists in to use natural capital accounting to put a value, a dollar value or a pound value, uh, on the public forest estate. And the report is, is worth a read because timber actually comes a long way down the list. It's fifth or sixth. Right at the top is recreation, aesthetic value. People pay more for houses that are overlooking woods than they do uh, overlooking uh, urban areas. Biodiversity refuge, uh, carbon sinks, uh, all of the water, all of those things are ahead of the, the commercial value of, of the timber. So it's quite clear that, that forests um, have different values to, to, to different people, but they are valuable. Um, it was overturned, incidentally, um, the government was not able to, to, to sell off the public forest estate. Um, and the way that, that that happened was to bring a bishop in to uh, decide that this should happen. And he convened a panel. And the panel agreed with the general public that we should not be selling off the public estate. In fact, we should be doing the opposite. We should be increasing forest cover in Britain from the, the poultry 12% it is at the moment to at least 14% by 2030. So good for the forests. 
Um, so reasons for nominating species for priority management also include social and cultural value, and that's that recreation. I walk my dog every day um, in, in, in the woodlands. Conservation value, environmental value, um, and invasiveness. But their key, their key conclusion will not be a surprise to anyone here that the number of species used and range in goods of service indicate the enormous value of forest genetic resources to support agriculture, forestry, and environmental sustainability. Bad news is that uh, half of the forest species reported by countries are threatened. The main threats, conversion of forest to other land use types, which we've already heard about, over-exploitation, and the effects of climate. Most species are conserved in situ as opposed to ex situ uh, in both natural and planted forests, and some examples there. And it is estimated that, that um, 700 species are managed in planted forests and approximately the same number in tree improvement programs, which is really not very many. And it's the reason that you see the same set of species uh, all over the world, eucalyptus and pinus and so on. They also said and found that um, Q's Millennium Seed Bank Partnership um, that uh, Bill mentioned has the largest, most diverse tree seed collections in the world, um, estimated currently 11,000 taxa. And that material is in long-term storage and is being actively used to research seed storage behavior, germination, dormancy, longevity, seed traits, and use. And I want you to note that botanic gardens are, are leading that particular uh, effort. So what's come out of that um, review, um, and actually the, the, um, the review was rather a long time coming, so the Global Plan of Action uh, came in advance of it by, by a few months because it was in draft for so long, is exactly that, a Global Plan of Action for the Conservation, Sustainable Use, and Development of Forest Genetic Resources. Um, and that includes the kind of things that you would expect, improving availability and access to data, to information, conservation, sustainable use, development, and management, and then policies, institutional, and capacity building. So what about food and agriculture? And again, there's a similar process uh, in place through FAO, through the Food and Agriculture Organization, but they are some way uh, ahead of the foresters. So the second State of the World's Plant Genetic Resources in Food and Agriculture report was produced in 2010, and there's the link into it. Um, and it covers current status of crop diversity, how it's preserved and used, the main achievements uh, at, at, at all levels, key technical and scientific advances, and then gaps uh, in knowledge that require attention. Their main findings are uh, not surprising, pretty obvious that plant genetic resources in food and agriculture are essential raw materials for helping farmers to respond to climate change. Um, that loss of those resources means reduced options for the agri agricultural sector. That local plant genetic resources in food and agriculture found in farmers' fields or in situ are still largely inadequately documented and managed. Uh, and that is a result of intensive agriculture, of course. There has been progress, um, and I'll, I'll enlarge on this uh, a little bit later, in securing plant genetic um, resources diversity in a large number of national gene banks, but much of that diversity, particularly of crop wild relatives and underused species relevant for food and agriculture, still needs to be secured for present and future use. And to put some numbers on that, um, FAO estimate that we eat between 12,000 and 30,000 um, plant species. Um, but, of course, 80% of our calorie intake comes from just 12. Now, I'm always intrigued by FAO's estimates, and I guess it's, it's, it's how edible something is um, between the 30,000 and the 12,000. But the fact is that there is a lot of edible plant diversity out there, which is not in agricultural seed banks, uh, and is out there in the wild taking its chances amongst that 20%. And the same is true, as we'll see, from crop wild relatives. Second main findings, um, rapid scientific advances, especially in information technology and molecular biology, have introduced new techniques uh, for conservation and use. Um, and significant policy developments have changed the landscape uh, of uh, management uh, of those resources. However, better communication, collaboration, and partnerships are needed amongst institutions dealing with the management uh, of those genetic resources from conservation to plant breeding and seed systems. So how is the food and agriculture or the crop community trying to get better at this? Um, and what they're trying to do is to build what they call a global system. And, and this global system uh, is in the literature. Um, it's in 
uh, State of the, the World's reports. It's in the, the Global Plan of Action um, for Agriculture. Uh, and it is a specific term, which um, I will uh, define for you in, in a second. It has a number of elements to it. It has a policy framework. So for crops, we have the International Treaty. Um, and this, unlike the Convention on Biological Diversity, is a multilateral access and benefit sharing treaty. 128 countries are signatories. Uh, and it covers defined crops. So it covers 35 food crops and 29 forages. Uh, and in theory, the international treaty means that seeds, plants can move between borders without any problem. In practice, it doesn't yet work uh, as it should do. And in practice, politics uh, have um, got involved with this. So there are some key crops which are not on the international treaty, including soya, um, including maize for that matter, uh, or at least maize wild relatives. So it's there, um, and it's being adopted by some countries, but not, not by other countries. But it is comes out of the Convention on Biological Diversity. It's meant to enable us to, to share these genetic resources that uh, are, if you like, the common inheritance of mankind and essential for our food security. We have a report uh, on the state of the world's plant genetic resources that I've just mentioned, and a global plan of action about how we can better use them. So those are the policy elements. We then have uh, a technical or infrastructure framework, and that is a network of international ex situ collections of major crops. Now, most of those uh, are, or at least most of the crops, are the big CG center gene banks. Uh, so that's the consultative group on international agricultural research that gets money from your government, from my government, and from governments all around the world. And they manage the big 11 uh, crop seed banks around the world, the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. CIMIT that deals with wheat and maize in Mexico and, and so on. Uh, and that infrastructure, those seed banks, are, uh, and, and not just seed banks actually, you, you'd be surprised to know that, that the world's most diverse banana collection is in Belgium. Um, and it's tissue culture um, because you can't uh, store bananas uh, as, as seeds. So that's one tier. And then the next tier down, we have national seed banks and facilities that have globally important collections. One of those is Fort Collins, um, USDA. But Brazil, uh, India, the BRIC countries, in fact, Russia, uh, have China, uh, have globally significant collections that are part of this global system. We then get to the data elements of this. And um, they have developed, the Crop Trust um, and um, the UN have developed a global portal of accession level data. That's called Genesis here. And this covers uh, all of the collections held in those CGIAR seed banks. So if you are wanting to find um, a cultivar of wheat or whatever, then you can go online, you can go to Genesis, and you can find out who holds that cultivar of wheat. But it doesn't tell you a great deal about, it doesn't tell you anything about the traits that that wheat might have. So the next level down um, is a, a universal crop gene bank information management system where Routinely, you're collecting traits, morphological traits um, in particular, uh, and you record those in your system. And so they're promoting now Grin Global, which is based on the USDA's uh, Grin system. And then finally, and this is just starting now, are advanced bioinformatic tools that will allow a crop breeder to go in and find specific genes um, that they want for, uh, for crop breeding. So something for yield, something for resistance to grassy stunt virus or whatever. Um, so that is what it entails as an infrastructure. And then they finally have something that we can only envy, and that is uh, money. Um, and they have a, a, the Crop Trust Endowment Fund, uh, which currently stands at $175 million. By 2018, they hope to increase that to $850 million. And the interest on that, and you'd be interested to know uh, that this uh, era of low interest rates that they get on average between 6 and 7% uh, per annum on that, um, would be enough to run this system in perpetuity. So the crop trusts um, who, who manage this fund, uh, their strap line is food security forever. Uh, and that's what they mean by a global system. They also have a multilateral fund, which currently doesn't work under the international treaty. So this is what it looks like uh, in its entirety. Policy elements at the top, 
the infrastructures and the collections of, of plant material in the middle, and then the data at the bottom still under development. So what about us? You know, what can we do that might be something similar? Well, we have a policy framework. It's called the Convention on Biological Diversity. 194 countries are signatories. Um, but it doesn't have a multilateral access and benefit sharing uh, arrangement. It has the Nagoya Protocol, which has established this, this idea of national sovereignty. Now, unfortunately, plants don't follow political boundaries, and that, that uh, complicates matters. Um, and it can get in the way uh, of conservation. But there are some good things about the CBD as well, and um, particularly diversion of resources to poor countries which happen to be biodiversity rich. We have a plan. We have the Global Strategy for Plant Conservation, which we've heard talked about a little bit here, with 16 targets in it. And we have a review process called the Global Partnership for Plant Conservation, and then also various other sort of acronyms there which are, are involved in trying to work out where we are with the Global Strategy. So we have a policy framework which is pretty comparable. What about the technical components? We also have a network of international ex situ collections and infrastructures in botanic gardens and arboretum. Um, and they are far more diverse uh, in far more countries than um, these, uh, the crop gene banks in their global system. We have a global portal of accession level data, and that happens to be managed by um, uh, by the organization that I currently work for. It's called Plant Search, and it has 1.3 uh, million records in it of collections held in roughly 1,000 botanic gardens around the world. So it's a snapshot. It's not comprehensive, um, but it is, does give us an idea um, about what is held where. We don't have a universal collections information management system. We're all using different systems, BG Base or Brahms or um, Iris uh, and so on. But we could get there, potentially, if it was desirable, and it may not be. Um, and we have a range of characterization tools and data resources. Um, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. So this is what it would uh, uh, look like uh, all together. Uh, and what I'd like to look at now is just the role of potential role of botanic gardens uh, in this global system. I believe that botanic gardens are uniquely placed to conserve and manage plant diversity. We have skills that are relevant to in situ and ex situ conservation right across the spectrum. We can find plants using our herbarium records. Crucially, once we get into the field, we can identify them and say, yes, that is the rare plant that we're looking for. We can conserve plants uh, in seed banks, tissue culture, gardens, and natural reserves. And many botanic gardens are, are now working in in situ conservation, uh, including uh, my own. We can restore habitats and reintroduce plant species. Uh, and we're learning gradually how to do that. Uh, and we can manage diverse species assemblages in, in diverse landscapes. This picture here, and I did promise you some plants, uh, is um, Leucodendron remotum from South Africa. It is uh, in. Uh, in a reserve, an 8,000 hectare reserve, but it's down to a single population, uh, and it has uh, become infested with a, a beetle. And when we went to collect seeds from this, we found that every single seed had been eaten by this uh, infestation, by this beetle. So this is a population that is now being actively managed by Huntum Botanic Garden uh, in South Africa to make sure that it doesn't become extinct. And we can go further. We can say there is no technological reason why any plant species should become extinct. With the array of techniques that we have, including in situ conservation, um, but with the array of techniques we have, including horticulture, seed banking, tissue culture, and so on, in theory, if we could get to them all, uh, and if we could manage them appropriately, we can avoid species extinctions. But there are some challenges that you will be very familiar with. One of those is that botanic gardens as a professional community are all things to, to all people with many conflicting um, priorities. They're visitor attractions. We need to get people in through the, the gates to raise revenue, and maybe that's their purpose. They're educational institutions. Sometimes they're attached to museums or to scientific organizations. Um, they're horticulture, ornamental uh, horticulture, so that people can come on a Sunday afternoon and see some beautiful plants. And they may be, be conservation organizations. But I think as a professional community, we lack confidence 
um, and clear direction quite often. Um, and I think that as a, as a result of that, we, we lack a voice and are not, not terribly well organized. We're not learning enough from each other. And the result of that is that people see botanic gardens as rather nice to have, uh, rather than essential. And the result of that is that we have trouble getting funding. So what can we do about that? I think we do need to organize ourselves better as a professional community and pr promote the unique skills that we have to policymakers and funders. I think we need to prioritize plant conservation within our own institutions. And I have recently got into trouble at Kew for suggesting that we should do that. But I believe it. I really believe it. We need to focus our efforts where our skills are most apt and appropriate, and that is on the rarest, most threatened, and most challenging species that frankly are not going to make it in situ. And there are thousands, there are tens of thousands of them. Uh, and I'll give you some examples in a moment. We need to facilitate plant conservation action with broader society through education, training, technology transfer, as well as within our own network. And we need to work with other sectors like forestry, horticulture, agriculture, and in situ conservationists who have far more in common with us than not. Um, and we need to work together to fundraise for conservation action, uh, including working with civil society to conserve plant diversity. And I think it is civil society that cares most about this. We all know that government money comes and goes. We all know that money from the corporate sector comes and goes, and mainly it's been going over the last uh, few years. Um, but civil society does care about these, these things, as we've seen with land trusts. I mean, in, in the UK, um, the National Trust is the largest landowner. Woodland trusts are buying up all the forest that, that uh, government doesn't want, and so on. And there is a large constituency of people out there in civil society who want to learn these skills, and they, they want to be actively managing plant diversity in the landscape. And we have technical networks. We have, um, here's one right up here. Some of them are regional, um, some of them around specific um, sort of technical challenges. Uh, the Ecological Restoration Alliance, I will be um, flying back to London on Saturday and out again on Sunday to Jordan, where the Ecological Restoration, and my family are not happy about this, by the way, where the Ecological Restoration Alliance has chosen um, to, to have their, their meeting on, on Monday. But that is a consortium of 20 botanic gardens who are serious about restoration. Uh, and so on. So we're not going to do this by saying, right, there's a central authority here, the way the, the crop guys do. We're going to say what people need to do is to, is to be conserving their own plant diversity, but sharing what they learn so that others don't, are not having to reinvent wheels. And we have infrastructures. Boy, we've got infrastructures. This um, is Plant Bank. This is, uh, was finished uh, in 2013, Royal Botanic Gardens at Sydney, um, at Mount Annan, one of their satellite gardens. It is the largest seed bank in the southern hemisphere. Um, but it's empty. It needs seeds in it. Um, this is Kunming Institute of Botany in Yunnan. Yunnan province in China uh, is 4% of China, but it has half of China's plant diversity, 15,000 of the 30,000 species. And they have already collected uh, a third of the Chinese flora, on average 10 populations per taxon. Millennium Seed Bank, um, most diverse uh, seed bank in, in the world with the, the broadest and largest collections. And your very own Fort Collins. Uh, there as well. We have the infrastructures within our, our network. So how are we doing? Uh, um, what do the collections look like? Um, I said 1.3 million a, a moment ago, which is the correct figure. Um, how many taxa do we have? And, and it's hard to work out because of synonymy issues. It's hard to work out also because we don't have a fully comprehensive global checklist yet. Um, but 350,000 species and counting. Um, we reckon the estimated total number of binomials uh, in um, botanic gardens and arborita is roughly 200,000. So over 50% of plant diversity is represented there. And of course, over recent decades, with the focus on collecting uh, rare and endangered species, nowhere near enough, but we're starting to get a handle uh, on, on that as well. Um, so we're not there, we're nowhere near there, but we, we do have um, a lot of expertise uh, and a lot of work under our, our belt. Of course, what this doesn't tell us is the conservation value of those collections. Um, those are living collections, um, but they don't tell us how useful they're going to be uh, in terms of being able to put them back into, into the landscape for conservation purposes. But they are Le older Leopold's every cog and wheel. 
uh, in one way or another. We have um, Accession's management databases. I mentioned um, Brahms, Grin Global as well, used for some um, botanic gardens. Uh, we have characterization tools and data resources. There's a couple of, um, from Q here. The UK germination toolbox is aimed at people wanting to restore habitats. Uh, if you want an optimal germination protocol for any UK native species, you can go in there, put your, your taxon in, and out will come how you get the best germination um, out of that. Uh, seed information database has trait information, including germination protocols, seed longevity, and so on. Uh, on it, uh, I think 10 traits that we measure for must be 60,000 plant species now. Um, trees for future, if you're a forester, um, again, that, that's genetic information, starting to put that together so that that's uh, of use to people wanting to, to, to breed crops for, uh, breed trees for commercial purposes, uh, and so on. But there are challenges. This is a picture from Zimbabwe. Um, and there's a great deal that we have to learn. And we heard about that from Elizabeth this morning. And this is just a, another list. But autocology covers a whole bunch of things. It covers um, uh, you know, plant-animal interactions, plant-microbe interactions, and so on. What is it um, that uh, we need to uh, ensure that a plant can survive? Habitat, all of those things. Genetic characterization, we know very little, um, even about our common, common species. In the UK, we, we have 50 trees which are considered native. We have genetic information about just five of those. It's incredible. This is, this is Western Europe. Um, sampling protocols, you know, how do we sample genetic diversity and, 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 and maximize the alleles that we're capturing? Seed longevity, we're starting to learn about that. Christina Walters at USDA uh, has done a lot of work on that, as um, we've done at, uh, at Kew. Um, so we can tell you that uh, primulaceae, if you put them in a seed bank, um, that they will lose viability after a few decades. But if you put a, a legume, a hard-seeded legume, in the seed bank, it will still be viable after a thousand years. So we're starting to be able to work out how long we can, uh, we can conserve seeds under seed bank conditions. Recalcitrant species, you know, what, what proportion of total plant diversity can you not store a seed uh, at dry, cool temperatures? And we estimate about 20%, but many of those are trees. Uh, and many of those are tropical trees. So what, what do we do about that? Uh, and there is work again going on at USDA with, with, with Chris and, and with others looking for a universal protocol for recalcitrant um, seeds. Tissue culture is an option. Dormancy germination. All of these um, are areas of research. And I will echo my fellow speakers in saying, if you are a graduate student and you're looking for something to do, there is a huge amount to be getting on with. And technology transfer. Um, Bill kindly mentioned the work the MSB has done uh, in training, vocational training in seed conservation. This is really so important because um, it enables people to be doing this themselves. And then measuring success. How do you, how do you measure success? And I think this is a constant issue. And it's, it's actually what has caused the big kerfuffle at Kew that uh, you may have read about in, in the newspapers. Um, <coughs> Q has brought in an entirely new science strategy. It's brought in um, academics from the University of, uh, of Oxford to look at the way the quality of Q science is measured. Um, and so the way that, that they've suggested this is measured is through papers that we produce, uh, impact factor, um, and research council grants. I would suggest something uh, a lot more appropriate and a lot simpler. And of course, the key word here is effectively. Um, how do you effectively conserve a species uh, in situ? How do you effectively conserve a species ex situ? But heaven knows there are enough guidelines out there. There's enough knowledge out there for us to be getting on with this. I know how we can conserve seeds effectively because we have protocols to do that for 80% of plant diversity, and they will still be there in a 1,000 years' time. Um, so there's a lot that we can be, be getting on with, I think, in the meantime. And if not, we should be trialing and, and uh, trying out in the field. And I firmly believe that botanic gardens should be conserving and managing plant diversity, not documenting, not just documenting and understanding it. Both are legitimate, but we also need to be getting our hands dirty. So some examples, and um, you know, I wanted to get to, to plants. I mentioned crop wild relatives earlier. Um, this is a project that uh, we at the Millennium Seed Bank started with the Global Crop Diversity Trust. Those are the guys with the big endowment and with the seed bank at Svalbard in the Arctic Circle. Um, and we managed to persuade the Norwegian government that uh, crop wild relatives were not 
conserved in the way that they need to be. And of course, these are the progenitors of our mainstream crops that have useful traits like disease resistance, like drought tolerance, and so on. And when SEAT um, in uh, Colombia did the gap analysis, they found that 53% of gene pool 1 and gene pool 2 crop wild relatives for 29 of our major crops um, were not in seed banks, and at least 20% of them are out there um, threatened uh, in nature. So we have a network of botanic gardens carrying out the targeting, the collecting, the processing, and duplicate storage of those crop wild relatives. We're also taking our seeds out uh, into restoration, and this is an example from um, the southeast of England where the Millennium Seed Bank is. Um, and, you know, again, this is about all landscapes being legitimate. Um, it just so happens that we have 2% of the, the, the species-rich meadows that we had um, at the beginning of the Second World War. Of course, with, uh, with um, needing to grow our own food in the Second World War, you kindly sent us quite a lot, but it wasn't enough. We cleared large areas, including meadows, and intensive agriculture came in. Now, there are consequences for that, and the consequences are conservation consequences, so decline of, um, of important wildlife species, but also pollinators. So it happens that our fruit industry is in the southeast of England, and we're having to import pollinators from, from uh, mainland uh, Europe to, to pollinate them in the spring. So the government is now keen that everyone who has any spare land restores meadows. The problem is that if you, are, as a landowner, want to do that, you go and buy um, a, a seed mix from a commercial company, and there are about 10 in Britain. You will find two things. You'll first find, first of all, that, that half of your seeds don't germinate, um, and you'll find a very narrow range of, of species that don't deliver the ecosystem services that they're supposed to deliver. And the reason for that is because uh, these small companies, largely um, family-run companies, do not have the time to be breaking dormancy. They, they, they need the simplest um, species that it, basically you pop it in the soil and up it comes. So we can help and uh, we've set up um, seed orchards to do this that, that supply primed um, high quality founder populations of seed for the industry to bulk up. We sell that to the industry uh, and we've been working with uh, 10 companies to improve their seed, seed processing techniques so that their seed stays viable for longer and so that the customer gets a better deal. Uh, and that's, again, a way that botanic gardens can help to get diversity back into the landscape. Just a few plants, um, some winners and some losers. This is Alangia remifolia. This is down to a single population um, in Botswana, uh, in, in Africa. And it happens to live uh, at a religious site, which is visited by pilgrims uh, every year, and it gets trampled. Um, and the, the remaining 20-year-old plants are up in, in the rocks where it can't be trampled. But it's now safely uh, in the seed bank, and when appropriate, we will we'll reintroduce uh, this species. There's no problem growing it. Um, it's simply people um, trampling all over it is the reason for its, uh, its extinction. Here's another one. This is um, Adenium bomianum. This, this one we've never been successful with. This is also from Botswana. Um, it's a desert rose, um, Aposinaceae. And... Over 10 years, we kept coming back to this population, and we never found it in seed. Um, we think it's ecologically isolated from uh, its pollinator, um, so it sets flower every year. Um, there's only three plants, um, and it never sets seed. It may be, uh, it may be genetic as, as well, I don't know. But it has a close relative, Adenium swazicum, which is in the same position, and there um, the problem is uh, overexploitation. It's used for medicinal species, and I was saying to Debbie that we we took a, um, a, somebody who was interested in supporting the work of, financially the work of the seed bank out to South Africa, and she was South African, and we took her to see the population um, of Adenium swazicum that we had been monitoring for many years. And when we got there, it had been dug up two weeks earlier um, by herbalists. It's a medicinal plant, and they use the roots. So it was completely gone, but there were holes in the ground. We knew there was another population within Kruger National Park, so we drove into Kruger National Park, and there it was, beautifully in flower. And along came a black rhino and ate every flower. <laughs> so why would you conserve that species? I mean, you might conserve it because black rhinos like it, but, <laughs> or you might conserve it for medicinal reasons. But, um, you know, this is a species, fortunately, that we do, we do now have in, in the seed bank. Uh, and we would be able to reintroduce. 
And here's uh, another one. This is Widringtonia whitey. This is the Mulanji cedar. This is Malawi's national tree. Um, and uh, this is down, it lives on a single mountain, Mount Mulanji. Um, and we can't grow it. Uh, it, um, it gets to five centimeters in height and then it falls over. We can germinate the seed perfectly well, um, but it doesn't establish. It doesn't establish on the mountain. It doesn't establish in, in nurseries. And we don't know uh, whether that's a mycological association, perhaps, whether it's a, a disease, whether it's specific requirements. But we need to bring multidisciplinary skills to this. We need plant pathologists. We need horticulturalists. We need somebody to, to save this species, because it is Malawi's national tree. Um, and it is also potentially a, a, an incredibly valuable um, forestry resource. And to give you an idea, um, under the British administration, when this was Nyasaland 100 years ago, and, and the British foresters tried to grow this without success, um, the, uh, the Mountaineers Club of Mount Mulanji, which was expatriates, um, they cut down some of these trees and they built, um, they built lodges, they built um, alpine huts made out of this material um, in the 1920s. Uh, and those, those alpine huts are still there in perfect condition. Um, and there's two meters of rainfall on that mountain. Um, and the wood is termite resistant, uh, it is rock resistant, it is all of those things. Um, one of them burned down a few years back and they built a replacement out of European cedar. And within 10 years it had rotted, rotted away. So this is the kind of thing I'm, I'm talking about, about uh, I, I guess our adaptive potential if we, if we look after every cog and wheel and if we can solve the problems uh, related to growing these species. So some quick conclusions. Plant diversity is essential for human innovation, adaptation, and resilience. And I like the fact that these Malawians are actually using seeds to play a pool with there. <laughs> it's an urgent issue. I came across this cartoon in the Irish Times a few weeks ago about austerity, but the austerity sign you could change for species loss or for climate change. It's the same story. We need to make this a priority. It may not be everyone's priority, but I think uh, we have a responsibility to make it our priority. And it may not be popular, um, but it is the right thing to do. Botanic gardens, as a professional community, have a unique knowledge and skills that they need to bring to bear um, on conserving and managing plant diversity in the landscape. And we need to show greater leadership. I think we wait for others to do this for us. Um, we need to step up um, and we need to be uh, taking responsibility for this, this work. We need to share what we learn uh, as well, and um, that means sharing approaches and results, those that work and those that don't work, because um, that's the only way that we're going to, going to learn together. And this is one part of science, I believe, that needs to not be competitive. We need to be sharing our findings uh, in, in uh, the most efficient way that we can, because it is urgent. And we need to work uh, with broader society. And I go back to that point I made at the very beginning, that all landscapes and all people um, are appropriate and legitimate. They all have a stake in plant diversity, whether they're farmers or whether they are conservationists. And the thing we have in common with them uh, is that it's in all of our interests to conserve plant diversity uh, as a whole. So I shall leave it there with a picture of plant diversity. Thank you. Thank you.